This week on the agenda, Britain's sailor shame. Why hundreds of Chinese mariners were forced to abandon their families and leave the UK after the Second World War. Hundreds of Chinese sailors who'd assisted the UK during World War II were forcibly and secretly deported after the conflict, so says a British government investigation seen by CGTN. Many were forced to leave the wives they'd married and children they'd fathered behind in Britain. Family members who've been left in the dark for decades. Guy Henderson explains. She has been searching for her father since she was 10 years old. Judy Kinnan's 79 now, a little frail but energised. Because Judy is convinced that he was amongst those men brought to this very dock in the spring of 1945 and secretly deported. They reckon they brought them down here, right, picked them up in vans, brought them down here, there were ships in the docks, they loaded them into the basement and took them out into the Atlantic. She shows us a plaque of remembrance erected by the families they left behind. For those who gave their lives to this country, thank you. To the many Chinese merchant seamen who, after both world wars, were required to leave. For those wives and partners who were left in ignorance of what happened to their men. For the children who never knew their fathers. Earlier this year, the British government for the first time admitted a policy of forced repatriation back then after decades of denial. But no record has emerged of Judy's father in declassified National Archives, officials say are incomplete. So at home, she clings to this solitary photo of him and now hopes that as the truth begins to emerge, something might show up. Because I've always wanted to know who my daddy was. Since you were 10 years old, that question, yeah. mm. and you're still searching. Just for them to tell me, if they did, take them and send them up way where he ended up and did he still live or did he die just apologize and tell me what they did with my father and have i got family in china that's all i want to know the fate of peter fu's father by contrast has been apparent for years now and he was subject to a forced deportation order yeah that's in the records and is now confirmed yeah he was sent to singapore Peter didn't want to see him. I said, no, I'm not going. I'm not going to Singapore. Because I mean, as far as I'm concerned, he done a run around us. So what do I want to go and see him for? So even back then you knew he was there? But, yes. But then you thought he'd abandoned you, so you didn't want to go and see him? That's correct. And when you found out that he had in fact not, was there some regret? Oh yeah, of course. It makes me more angry about it all. Because, because it's all coming out, the truth. And if and you'd known at the time, it would be different. The truth's come too late for him. His father's since passed away. Local MP Kim Johnson, whose Labour Party was in power when the deportations took place, has all the same been pushing for an official apology, which is yet to come. Some of the actions that were undertaken by public sector bodies, you know, they want to hide away. They separated fathers, husbands um, from families. The report identifies how um, racially challenged it was, you know, because US servicemen and police servicemen weren't treated in, in the same way as Chinese yeah. seamen. Sorry may provide closure for some family members, but people like Judy Kinnan say they need more than that. After a void that's lasted a lifetime, they want answers before it's too late. Guy Henderson, CGTN, Liverpool. We can speak now in more depth to one of the people we saw there in Guy's report, the Member of Parliament for Liverpool Riverside, Kim Johnson. Thanks ever so much uh, for, for taking time out of your, your schedule to talk to us. Now, up until this report, the Home Office had consistently maintained that there hadn't been an enforced repatriation of married men, in spite of its own memo memos describing a, a de facto manhunt. So how did the report build a picture of what happened to lead to that acknowledgement? 
Well, Julia, what I would say was as a result of my adjournment debate, the Home Office and the front bench minister, Kevin Foster at the time, committed to undertaking some more research, so employed a researcher and um, um, identified the relevant paperwork and reports that identified very clearly what happened after the war and all those public sector organisations that were in complicit in making sure that happened. So it wasn't just the Home Office, it was the police and it was also the shipping lines. So we've heard that this policy was to free up housing for returning servicemen. Um, it sounds a lot more complicated than that. I mean, why did the UK have this forced deportation policy? Well, I think um, at one point, the Chinese seamen were seen as being difficult. They were identified in the report as being criminals. They were employed by the shipping lines and they were employed on less wages. And they didn't receive the, the war bonds. So if they were killed in war, their families didn't get funding um, that they um, were um, that they were entitled to. And so the Chinese seamen, with the help of um, the union, um, mounted a strike and a campaign, and they were eventually given um, the funding and the, the pay that they um, were entitled to. And so they were seen as troublemakers. And I think that was one of the reasons also that there was this forced repatriation of the 2000 seamen after the war. Was it illegal under British law? Well, I think at that time, um, Juliet, it wasn't illegal. You know, um, we, you know that we've had um, a range of different immigration legislation and equality acts have come out, you know, way after that time. So, it, you know, in the eyes of um, the government, it wasn't illegal. And we'd seen other forms of repatriations taking place as well, but it wasn't seen as illegal. However, for me, you know, the act undertaken by the government and the police and the shipping lines, you know, left so many families bereft and unaware of what happened to their husbands, fathers, loved ones, you know, for, for, for many, many years until the, the actual papers were um, released and people, you know, um, saw the real truth of what happened at that time. And, and a lot of the families are talking about how, you know, their fathers and loved ones were actually kidnapped off the streets. You know, that's how um, um, awful it was for the families. So the papers were released, the report has been published, and yet still no formal apology to, to these families. Well, what's taking so long there? Well, I, I think, personally, that the, the government don't want to own up to it. And they've, you know, they've acknowledged, acknowledged in the report that it was racist. They've acknowledged that it should never have happened, but you know they fall short of making that actual apology and uh, and acknowledging it. But you know, for me, um, I think sadly, this happened under um, the Labour Party under Attlee's watch, and you know we've spoken to the Labour Party also to provide. Um, an apology and acknowledgement and, and that's not been forthcoming but we're, you know, we're still going to be pushing you know, the families still want to push and campaign um, for the apology and acknowledgement of what happened to um, their loved ones so, so what are you doing and what can others do to, to get that apology? Well, so, you know, what we've been doing um, since the adjournment debate and since I entered Parliament is raising awareness working with a range of stakeholders. Uh, the, the descendants of those seamen have, you know, formed a WhatsApp group. You know, they've um, done a lot of media themselves. The, the um, print media have, have written stories. Um, the um, descendants of the seamen had a meeting with Yvette Cooper, who's our shadow um, um, Home Office Minister, during the Labour Party conference. And, uh, Yvette has committed to going back to the Home Office and putting some pressure on the Home Office as well, because, as you will know, there's been a change of guard in um, in, in Parliament and so different people. So um, she's going to go back to the Home Office to see what other um, support can be available to, to the families. Uh, we're, we're looking at working with National Museums Liverpool 
I met recently with um, the chairperson of PH Health Trust, which was linked to the shipping line, you know, but the, the shipping line no longer ex exists. And a lot of the papers from that time are um, archived in the National Museum in Liverpool. So it's looking at some of the papers because the, the families still want to know um, more information about the families, what ships, you know, where did they go, where did they end up? You know, and they're talking now about looking at DNA testing. You know, we've seen, you know, some of these shows where families have been connected by linking their DNAs. And, and I think that's something that a lot of the families are quite interested in, particularly as families who don't have a name. You know, so there are things that we're, we're pushing for at the moment. And what about those shipping companies? How culpable are they? They are extremely culpable, um, Juliet. And you, if you've read the, the report, Pelt Shipping Line particularly plays a very prominent role in um, forcing the, the deportations and working complicitly with the Home Office and the police. And the, um, that report has been shared with, with the Trust and the Trustees and um, the chairperson of the Trust was um, um, very supportive in terms of what they could do to help with um, maybe establishing some permanent memorial within the community. So I've met with the chair. Then there's going to be a follow-up meeting with the descendants and the chair of PH Health Trust to look at what they would like to see happen as a permanent memorial. So look, there's a lot of confusion. There's been denial, missing files, attempts to, to shift the blame so much. It's still yeah. unknown. I mean, will we ever uncover the, the real story here? I think we have the essence of the real story, if I'm honest with you. But it's um, finding the paperwork that matches families to their fathers. And I think that's um, the real sad indictment of um, papers going missing or being destroyed, sadly, because, you know, families that I've met with, you know, you know, what, what, one particular descendant, his father was deported, his mother died when he was young, he ended up in care and, you know, until quite recently was not aware of any of this. So I think um, every time I have a meeting, more and more um, descendants are coming to the meeting to say, yeah, I didn't know. And um, I've reached out to get support from the rest of the group. And, and I think that's one of the sad indictments of this whole um, sorry saga, really. So, uh, to an extent, too, too little, too late. But I, I want to talk to you about the, the, these missing files because many of the papers were declassified as far back as 2002. Um, yes. I thought that maritime file keeping was notoriously thorough, in which case, where is the list of the 2,000 missing sailors? And I think this is um, the, the question we're asking at the moment and, you know, and hopefully um, Yvette will be able to get some more information. I'm hoping that if we can gain access to the um, shipping line files that are archived at the National Museum Liverpool, that they might uncover some of the names, some of the ships that were used uh, and provide some um, closure to the families. But I've, I've made that request to National Muse Museums Liverpool pool and um, we'll be chasing it up as soon as possible. I want to pick up on something you, you mentioned earlier because 75 years on there has been increased uh, public awareness and the report confirms that the Liverpool families were brutally ripped apart by mm -hmm. the racist and coercive actions of the British government. Mm -hmm. So what should happen next? Well, you know, ultimately what the families are looking for, Julia, is to have an acknowledgement and, um, and an apology. You know, some, fa some families are, are talking about um, some type of compensation, you know, akin to um, the Windrush families and, you know, because there has been some comparisons made in terms of how the families were treated, you know, taken away and, and um, dumped in a country that they'd not had any connection with, because that's what happened to a lot of those seamen. You know, they were just dumped in, you know, part of China's that they have no connections with. 
And, you know, some members, uh, family members are talking about um, the need for compensation, but that has not been um, at the forefront of a lot of the families. It's mainly about acknowledgement um, um, an apology and trying to find the missing information, you know, making connection to their fathers. What do you think that this story tells us about discrimination and racism in Britain, but both then and now, all this, these decades on? You know, um, what it tells me is that, you know, the British government, you know, colonialism, imperialism, you know, still is prevalent. In cities like Liverpool, that has long-established diverse communities who were still suffering the, the after-effects of, you know, colonialism and, and all of the consequences that brings, really. Kim Johnson, MP, thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you today. Still to come here on the agenda, the history of the forgotten allies. We'll get more detail from Liverpool historian Professor John Belcham. We can try out the wild and crazy ideas. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very busy when we're trying to save the world. Awesome. We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with Global Business, only on CGTF. What do we mean when we talk about the difference? The difference is in the detail, in the background, Defense ministers from the wider angle and perspective of every story, wherever the story may be. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to the agenda. We've heard from local MP Kim Johnson about the families of the forgotten Chinese sailors and their continued fight for an apology. But who exactly were these men and how did they come to be in Liverpool in the first place? With me now is John Belcham, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of Liverpool. Thanks ever so much for, for joining us. So, Professor, who were these Chinese sailors? What were they doing in Liverpool and what role did they play in the war effort? Well, Liverpool, having established itself as the great Western Emporium of Albion, suddenly got even more ambition and control over the oceans right across the globe. And so trade with the Far East became very, very important. And Chinese sailors were extremely significant in this. Um, alas, of course, there was a, a racial hierarchy so that the British sailors on the ships uh, earned far more money than the Chinese, but everybody agreed that the Chinese were actually more efficient than the British. Um, so the numbers increased significantly, uh, particularly when the Alfred Holt Company, who owned Blue Funnel Line, uh, was formed in the 1860s. Soon after that, of course, the Suez Canal opened, so the trade with the Far East expanded and expanded. And these Chinese seamen became very, very important. But I think in part because of the unfair treatment they received in terms of wages and income and so on, it's not surprising that when the ships came to Liverpool, many of them took the opportunity of jumping ship and exploring the delights of Sailor Town Liverpool. Um, which was, was considerable. And we soon find that a, a significant number of these Chinese seamen uh, establish themselves. They run restaurants, laundries, grocery stores, and so on. And an awful lot of them, of course, marry British women. Um, and they become really quite a, a functional immigrant community. Although 
concerns grow. I mean, of course, ac across the world, there was this yellow peril. I mean, Americans, Australia, New Zealand, and so on. All of these were trying to have a sort of a whites only policy. Liverpool had resisted that until the beginning of the 20th century, when the Aliens Act was introduced in 1905, after which the, uh, there was a considerable outcry, sensationalist journalism, stigmatizing the Chinese as being drunken, so, being responsible for sexually transmitting diseases, gambling, drug taking and so on. All of this was, was absolute rubbish as the city council found out when it established a commission of inquiry in 1907, which showed that the, the Chinese were of, of all the various uh, components of cosmopolitan Liverpool, they were the best behaved and easily the ones that they wanted to uh, encourage. Well, numbers of Chinese seamen, of course, increased during the First World War because they were very much needed in the, in the war effort in the Atlantic and so on. Um, but after the First World War, although this still has yet to be recovered, they were forcibly repatriated because they were technically aliens. They did not have any right of British citizenship or British residence. You've talked about the First World War and how the Chinese merchant seamen were, were seen as good migrants, a good, strong migrant community. Um, but what, how did things change after the Second World War? Well, after the Second World War, we, we enter a period which historians have called whitewashing Britain there was considerable concern about the uneasy transition from, from war to peace. And the real victims in this were always those who were considered to be, to, to be migrant. And the first to really feel the force of these new harsh attitudes were the Chinese, because the Chinese were technically aliens. And therefore, it was quite possible, uh, although one has to say considerably reprehensible for the authorities to use various means to say that as aliens, they should be, well, they use the word repatriated, but what they really meant was deported. Are you saying that maybe these Chinese merchant sailors were the forgotten ally of the Second World War? Well, they certainly were the forgotten ally. I mean, they were, um, as was always the case, uh, ship owners really welcomed as many Chinese seamen as they possibly could. Um, for two reasons. One, they were very, very efficient and good workers. And second, they were cheap. Um, and they also were the ones who suffered immensely during the World War II, because most of these Chinese seamen, of course, are not working on the upper decks. They're down in the stokeholes, in the engine rooms, in the kitchens, areas which are far more dangerous. And appallingly, the, government, the, the shipping companies were not paying them a proper war bonus, war risk bonus. Um, and that led to Chinese trade unions um, being formed in, in, in Liverpool. There was also evidence of links with the Chinese Communist Party. So there were some political and industrial concerns. But when you look at the way the authorities in Britain handled it, they put all that aside and used the basic stigmatizing of the Chinese. You know, these were people who were sexually immoral, were criminal, were drunken, were pushing the drug trade and so on. Uh, and this was why they said they had to get rid of these people because they were they were spread into tuberculosis, they were spreading VD, and if they married with English women, they only married the prostitute class. And all of this is absolutely scandalous and outrageously incorrect. So then, in the space of just a few months, all of these men who had made new lives in Liverpool and other parts of the UK were sent back um, to the Far East. And with all the post-war reconstruction taking place, I mean, where did this deportation fit in? Well, I mean, as I say, it was the it was the first stage of a definite hardening of attitudes, which you can see are coming just before the arrival of the the Empire Windrush, and um, this is the beginning of of. of of the authorities and the government struggling to come to terms with, with, with migration. I mean, part migration was needed. There was labour shortages in most of, uh, most of the UK, but not in Liverpool. With the end of the war, uh, shipping took a hit, and so you could argue that you did not need so many seamen. And, of course, a lot of the Chinese seamen had, quite sensibly, in view of the way they were exploited on board ship, decided to make a... Uh, a port side living, you know, they were they were much happier living in Liverpool. But these were people who were considered undesirable. Um, all of those, those things that I've talked about, the stigmatisation of the Chinese came in, came into play. Um, and the, the the thing about them was, I suppose, it was inverted commas, 
easier to get rid of them than the problems with, I use the terminology of the time, the British coloreds or the colored colonials, people who had actually, a, well, were British. Um, now, the, the difficulty with the Chinese is that the government failed to acknowledge that the fact that those Chinese seamen who had married Chinese women, they didn't acquire the right of British citizenship, but they technically did have the right of domicile. But this was completely ignored. They were just rounded up and sent back without any attempt to even to allow them to say goodbye to their wives, their children or anything. It's, it's a really quite a horrendous story. Why then do you think it's taken so long for, for this story to, to come to light and to be revealed? Um, and why it's taken so long to get some kind of apology? Yes, well, I think that when, when Liverpool has examined what I, one has to admit is a, a, a very embarrassing and troublesome history, it has tended to focus on the absolutely heinous slave trade. Um, and any attempts to come to terms with trying to improve Liverpool's appalling record of race relations has focused on that at the expense of other groups like the Chinese, who really were, as you say, you know, great allies during the, the world wars and so on. These people have just, 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 just got ignored and the things were stuck away in, in archives and so on. I mean, I was very fortunate to, to come across the, that, that home office file, but I mean, even Foley and other people had found all these things beforehand, but why they had not really reached through um, until now, I, 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 I don't know, because it is, it is an absolute, absolute scandal. And it's a scandal that predates uh, the, uh, the, the Windrush scandal. It's something which predates the development of a hostile environment. I mean, the Chinese suffer being aliens because you could legally uh, deport them, even if they're morally and ethically, that was completely wrong. Uh, it was very, very difficult with those who are actually people who belonged to the colonies because they technically did have a legal status that, alas, the Chinese did not. Were Chinese sailors used in this way by other European merchant navies or was it a particularly British thing? I think it's a, it's, it's a particular... Well, we've got to remember, I mean, how strong the British merchant marine was, you know, that um, at this time mo you know, most of the, the ships are still registered in, in, in Liverpool. And that it, when you look at um, things like the, the Alfred Holt Company, it had been buying up uh, Dutch, German and other shipping lines and so on. So they, they still come really within that British umbrella of, of ownership. So I think really this is something that, that, that Britain has to acknowledge that their, their role was considerably worse than, than that of other European countries. But there were other European countries who, who did employ Chinese sailors. Yes, I'm, 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 sure, I'm sure they were, because I mean, the, the Chinese were, were, were fantastically good merchant seamen, um, and everybody could get them on the cheap. So, you know, what, why not? The UK Home Office report um, talks about the racial and coercive dimension to all of it. I mean, what, do you think this was then something that was unique to Chinese sailors in the UK? Do you think other nationalities were affected? I mean, you, you mentioned that because of Commonwealth and, and colonial ties, yeah. they were seen as different. Well, well they were seen as different because, of course, they meant in, in law they were British, but of course they were phenotypically different. You know, they had a different colour skin, and that caused all sorts of difficulties in this time of, of, of whitewashing Britain. Um, and I mean, and that's another reason, perhaps, why the Chinese thing has got uh, scandal has got buried away because. Uh, ever from, well, from this, this all happened in 1945, 1946. Uh, fr from 1948 onwards, Britain is agonising over what to do with the fact that it's got people who are British, but unfortunately are the wrong colour. Uh, and that takes up all the time, all the energies of trying to work out what to do with that. And the, the, what happened with the Chinese just, just, just gets forgotten because it's seen as insignificant by the much greater problem of how you deal with, I, I quote again, coloured colonials. Professor John Beltram, thank you. Thank you. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming up on a future agenda, the art of the deal, why poetry could be key to business success in the Chinese market.
But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all of the Agenda team here in London, goodbye.